some of the people in this crowd will be not sure how to raise money, not sure whether the idea is going to have legs, whether or not you've even discovered your first users, you've worked out your revenue model. And so Jeff Lin here is the CEO of Cedars, which is a crowdfunding platform. And he's going to spend a little bit of time talking to you about how best to leverage um, not only crowdfunding, but how it works, how does it break down when you have multiple investors, talking about all of the exciting things regarding share options and the money and the piece after that. Then afterwards, we have Dan Such, who's head of development for Nominet Trust. And he's going to talk to you about how you can take money uh, especially from social grants, to sort of get early stage investment for some of the social ideas that you may have. Now, he's going to talk a bit more about the sort of social implication of that, the investment implication, and how to do that. So two very different speakers, two very different ways of raising uh, money and finance. Um, and we're going, to start with uh, we're going to start with Jeff, unfortunately, uh, who's in the busy process of trying to eat a sandwich. So um, we'll ap I apologize for bringing him up quite so quick. Um, I'm really sorry, Jeff. If you, if you get this done very quickly and you're a good boy, I'll let you eat. Yeah? Please join me in welcoming Jeff to the stage. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Um, are we all set here? So the, the advantage to having a hungry speaker is that I will go very, very fast and not keep you here. No. Um, Thank you all very much for coming. My name is Jeff Lynn. Ben said I am a CEO and co-founder of Cedars. Uh, Cedars is an equity crowdfunding platform. And just before beginning, I just got kind of curious uh, sense of, 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 of how familiar you all are with crowdfunding. I'm going to take it as given that you've probably heard of Kickstarter. Can you raise your hand, though, if you, if you feel you have a different, an idea of the difference between Kickstarter and, and equity crowdfunding? Okay, a few, a, a few, but probably worth sort of sort of starting out. So the, the, the idea behind Kickstarter and many other platforms that fit into what's called the rewards-based crowdfunding space is that you're raising money in exchange for something that's non-economic. So as an entrepreneur or as a project creator, you are... Um, uh, you're asking people to give you money, uh, and what you're giving them in return is not a stake in the business. Uh, it could be anything from a really good feeling about having funded you, uh, which sometimes works for kind of nonprofit creative projects, tends not to work well if you're trying to make money. People don't like to donate money to you if you're going to go out and get rich. Um, but where it does work for entrepreneurs, and where a platform like Kickstarter is amazing, is if you've got something to sell. And Emily Brook and Blaze is, is a fantastic example. Pebble Watch on Kickstarter is another fantastic and, and very well-known example. Where what's, hap what's happened there is they've taken in money in order to build a product, and they then send you a version of the product, and it is a pre-sale. And if you have, and if your business is building a product like that, and usually it's got to be kind of a consumer product, something a little interesting, something a little different, uh, and that you, and you know it's something that you can that you're looking to sell in the kind of 25, 50, 100 pound, dollar, euro range. Um, those platforms provide an amazing opportunity, and I am a huge fan of Kickstarter and others. What we do at Cedars, and I'll talk you through a little bit about the Cedars process in a second. And we do equity crowdfunding. So instead of offering a tangible reward, you are giving shares in your business. You are doing the same thing with individuals uh, that you would do with business angels or with venture capitalists or with any other type of investor. Um, and what's exciting about that is that that can work for any type of business. Most entrepreneurs, most businesses out there, and I would venture to say a majority of people here working on a given business, aren't actually making a sort of neat, cool little consumer product. There are loads and loads of other business types out there. And for businesses like that, Kickstarter really and, and, and rewards-based platforms really aren't an opportunity. But if you're looking to grow, and if you want to create value, and you want to create returns for the people who back you, equity crowdfunding is there. And that's the kind of high-level difference. So with that, let me uh, just sort of dive very much, very quickly in. And I'm going to break this into two parts. I'm going to talk about Cedars and what we do and how we work. And this isn't meant to be entirely self-promotional, um, but it is, I think, helpful to understand the process. And if I'm going to talk about any process, I'm going to talk about ours. Um, and then I'm going to sort of finish with some thoughts on how to succeed at crowdfunding. If you do use a platform like ours and or Kickstarter or many others, um, just some tips and tricks that we have found uh, in terms of what distinguishes a successful crowdfunding project from an unsuccessful one. So by way of background, my co-founder and I started working on Cedars over four years ago, and we did so with two, with, with two observations in mind, two pain points we wanted to address. 
One is that entrepreneurs lack access to genuine seed stage capital. And, and you know, I, you will have heard this morning from Dale Murray and from Simon Cook uh, and others. And one of the interesting things about sort of the angel and venture capital community is that often as people are looking to start up new businesses or looking to potentially raise capital, they hear from angels, they hear from venture capitalists, but actually those are very rarely the first people that you're able to go to. Most angels and almost all venture capitalists will expect you to have built something and to have actually gone out there and gotten some traction and move forward before they'll even talk to you. They may be very friendly, they may want to stay in touch, but they won't invest in you until you build something. So how do you go about getting that first 25, 50, 75,000 pounds, dollars, euros, uh, in order to raise that first bit of capital, in order to take that first step? Um, and the answer traditionally is it's really tough. Um, if, you, if you have a rich uncle, it's kind of easy. Uh, if you've been working in the city for 15 years and have saved up lots of bonuses, it's kind of easy. But for the vast majority of, in, of entrepreneurs, it's been very, very difficult. And the reason is that it's too small for venture capitalists and most institutional investors. One notable exception is accelerator programs. Programs like Wira and Seedcamp and Techstars and others do invest at that level, but they are, they, are, they are by their nature limited in size and there are only so many that can participate. And they tend to invest only a certain amount and sometimes you need more. We actually just had a Wira funded startup fund on Cedars today just by, by way of an SI. They raised some money through Wira and some money through so by and large, VCs and institutional investors, except accelerators, really don't provide an opportunity. And it's too early for most angels. And this is one of my favorite statistics. Only 3% of angel investing in the UK is seed. There is a, there's a perception that you come up with an idea uh, and you go to an angel investor and he or she writes you a check. Um, and that's sort of a Silicon Valley perception. And there is some truth in it there, possibly. But in the majority of the world, including here, Angels tend to invest in businesses that are further along. So what you have is friends and family. And if you have friends and family, if you have that rich uncle who can write a 25,000 pound check, great. But there's no way to get lots and lots, or traditionally there was no way to get lots and lots of friends and family to put in small amounts. So that was one set of pain points we looked at. The other set is on the investor side. And it's very important if you're thinking about raising money or starting a business to understand your investors' incentives and investors' motivations. Every investor wants something a little different. They want something a little different in the way of, of returns. They want something different in the way of information. They want some, a little something different in the way of how you sell to them. And so I'm a big believer in understanding what it is that investors want. And it's important to understand that, on, that where we came from and what we were looking at is that investing in startups appeals to a lot of people. There are loads of people out there who want to invest in startups, sometimes because it's, it's fun, it's exciting, sometimes because they want to support businesses, and sometimes because it's a really good asset class. I haven't gone into all the details here, um, but in a different presentation I do sometimes point out that the data shows that when you invest in startups as an asset class across a wide range of businesses, the returns are actually really, really good. They're skewed in the sense that most fail and only a few succeed, but as an asset class they perform very well. Traditionally, though, investing in startups was really limited to the top 1%. And on top of that, it's the top 1% who have lots of time and energy and ability to engage in things. And, you know, it's interesting. With greatest respect to Dale Murray, Dale sits on our advisory board and is one of my favorite angels in the community. She is very, very much typical of who gets to become an angel. She made a tremendous amount of money selling her business, and now she doesn't have to have a full-time job and can devote her time to this. And that is fantastic. But that's a real minority of people out there, including people with capital and the people with an interest in investing in startups. Those were the two pain points. And so we came up with a solution. We built a platform that allows people to invest in startups. Uh, you can invest as little as 10 pounds or as much as the full amount the business is seeking, which is capped at the moment at 150,000 pounds, although we do make exceptions. And then we let startups raise up to 150,000 pounds, sometimes more, seamlessly from friends, family, and independent investors. So here's how we work, and I'm gonna walk through this very, very quickly, but very happy to take questions at the end during the Q&A session about mechanics, or afterwards I'll be around and happy to go into any detail. But broadly speaking, as an entrepreneur, you create a listing or a campaign. It contains information about your business, which we, we review. One point to note here is we don't ask for business plans. We don't ask for financial projections. We actually think that for a seed stage business, financial projections are useless. Uh, we're much more interested in your story. Who are you? What's your idea? Who are you trying to sell to? It's not that we don't want to know the money bit, but the money bit's much more about how are you thinking about creating a great business here rather than what, do you, what, do, what random number have you selected to be your revenues in year four. Um, 
So you provide all this information, you can do a video pitch. You also say how much money you're seeking to raise and how much equity you're willing to give away. So maybe you'll say I'm looking for 50,000 pounds and I'm giving away 20% of the business. We do a little bit of an iterative process with you and once you're happy and we're happy with, where, with, with how the campaign has come together, it goes live on the platform and investors have the opportunity to review and invest. Everything's online and it's, it's interesting. I always put that point in because sometimes I speak to sort of rooms full of, of, of much older folks who sort of wonder how they go about signing documents and scanning things back and forth. All done online, it's all straightforward, but investors can engage with you through our Q&A forum or offline. And larger investors will often reach out to entrepreneurs and say, hey, I'm really interested. I think I might want to invest a meaningful amount, but can we meet for a coffee? Can I talk with you? And they actually start engaging in a process that's similar to raising money from an angel, but they then come and, and, and structure the, 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 the investment through us because it's simpler and easier and aggregates with everybody else's investment. And then, of course, from an investor perspective, it's a company-by-company company basis. We're not a fund. We're just allowing investors to pick companies they want to invest in. So if you don't get all the money you're seeking, it's all or nothing. If you don't get all the money you're seeking in three months, everybody gets their money back and it's a wash. But if you do hit your target, we then engage in a legal due diligence process with you, much like an angel or venture capitalist would, and we enter into a subscription agreement with you, much like an angel or venture capitalist would. And then we make the investment and hold it as nominee uh, for the underlying investors. And I'll say a bit on the next slide why that's so critical. Um, but the other thing, important thing to be said here is this is where we get paid. We don't charge anything to pitch. You come onto the platform absolutely for free. We don't believe in pay to pitch and paying just for the chance to raise, to, to potentially raise money. But if you successfully raise money through us, we take a 7.5% 7 commission. And that includes all legal fees, all structure. We even incorporate the company for you if you're not incorporated yet and do a bunch of other work. For most companies, it works out being even cheaper than it would be to go to lawyers. Sometimes it's perhaps a little bit more, but in turn, you're also getting capital alongside the work. So going forward as an entrepreneur, you have the chance to grow the business. And here's, here's the critical bit. You can access the full base of your, your full investor base, which may be 50, 100, 200 investors, but you're only dealing with us as the sole legal shareholder. And they, that, that I can't emphasize enough that in, in crowdfunding, that is an absolutely, in equity crowdfunding, that's an absolutely critical bit. It is wonderful to have a few hundred people with a vested interest in your success. These are gonna be your beta testers, they're gonna be your mavens, they're gonna be your early adopters, they're gonna make connections for you, they'll make intros. Some of them may get really super deeply involved in the business if you want them to, you can ask them to join the board or do other things. Others may be more passively, you'll just chip in when you want, but there's a huge amount of value from that. And many of the businesses that have used us so far, we funded 35 businesses to date, and many of the businesses that have, funded, have come through us have done so primarily because they wanted access access to that base of support. The flip side is having hundreds of registered shareholders who you have to deal with on all legal points is a real pain in the ass. It's difficult at best and actually it can be a company killer at worst. If you have lots and lots of shareholders, all of whom have various forms of voting rights, all a party to a subscription agreement, and you go on to raise additional capital, uh, later stage investors will often look at you and say, no way in hell. It's just too difficult. There's no way to track down all the consents needed and all the various documentation. So, we have separated the two. You get all the sort of soft influence and soft support that come from investors being part of your business, but you only have to face us as your legal shareholder. We cast votes, we sign consents. When you have a business go on to raise additional capital, I or one of my team am the one who go in, sign the documents, and you're off to the races. And that we think is a very, very important part of the model. And from investors' perspective, what they're getting is information about how you're progressing, involvement if you and they want, and returns. We are voting and monitoring the shares for them, but they can get as involved in the business as they like. We then pass on the proceeds from any dividends that you pay, as well as if they sell their shares at a profit. And then we take a fee from them, and this is a 7.5% upside in anything they make. So it doesn't affect the business, but any profits they get as a return off their investment, we're taking that and we call it a 7.5% carry. So what have we done so far? Um, I said 1.8 million invested across 32 deals. Uh, that's unfortunately, I did this deck two days ago. Uh, we're now up to 35 deals funded and just short of 2 million pounds. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>
We, um, we've got 15,000 investors registered on the platform and growing very quickly. Uh, and our, particularly uh, some of our first stage of companies, we launched in July 2012, and we're now starting to see the fruits of the first, the first batch going on. So we've had a company go on to get funded, um, you do an A round with ba Balderton and Passion after raising money through us. We've had companies go on to great accelerator programs. We've had wonderful, wonderful products being released. And we're seeing a tremendous amount of success and traction. And I think to a number, maybe there's an exception, but to a number, the entrepreneurs who've raised capital for us, f through us, uh, have felt that it has been a, a beneficial and in many ways, the ideal way for them to have started their journey up the equity ladder. So that's us. Now, to you. How do you succeed at it? What distinguishes the 35 companies that have succeeded from the 250 or so companies that haven't? And we only see about 15% of businesses on our platform successfully fund. And there's a, that's partially intentional. We, we want to be as open as possible and leave it to wisdom of the crowds. But we also want every business to stand the best chance it can of raising its funding. And the first thing to be said about crowdfunding is that it is not easy. There is a perception, and this applies, and much of what I'm going to say here applies just as much in the Kickstarter universe as it does on Caesars, but there is a perception that you kind of put up your listing and sit back and people throw money at you. And the truth is that the, the rules of capitalism haven't changed any. You still need to sell. You still need to market. You need to convince investors to be, to be interested in you. Sometimes the text of the campaign is enough to get people interested, but there's a lot more to it. So, the first part is making the pitch look good. And it has to be articulate and it has to be clear. I mean, one, one feature of the internet, as you all appreciate, I'm sure, is that attention spans are limited. Um, and you want to catch people pretty quickly uh, and get them excited and interested. A lot of investing, and this is true offline too, is about emotion. It's do I, do I like what you're doing? Do I think it makes sense? Do I, want, do I feel like I want to be part of it? And using your campaign to convey that and do that is absolutely critical. It also has to show that you've done a meaningful amount of thinking about your business. And you know, we focus on seed stage businesses, and part of our philosophy is that the term investor ready, which you'll sometimes hear among angel networks, uh, is sort of a nonsense term in the sense that anything can be invested in. At the right valuation, you can invest in somebody with an idea on the back of a napkin. Um, and we're very keen to see businesses funded at their earliest stage. We don't think that you have to somehow or another win the lottery and build your product before you can be invested. But it's really, really helpful to show that you've done everything you can do without capital before you then go try to raise money. And what, what investors don't want to back is you sitting there saying, eh, yeah, I kind of got this idea and maybe it'll work and let's give it a shot. What they want to back is I've sat there, I've thought, I've talked to everybody I could, I've gotten meetings, I've hustled, I've hacked my way in to as much of this as I can, and here's what I've accomplished. Now I need money to go to the next step. Now I need to hire a developer. Now I need to pay for marketing, et cetera. And that's a really, really critical bit of the campaign. The other bit of it is it does have to be engaging. And we are trying, and this is a, a, as much on our, our plate as it is on, on entrepreneurs' plate, is you want to make the campaign something people want to watch. Videos are important. Witty stuff is important. Attractive people are important. I mean, it's a terrible thing to say, but, and, and it's really, really taboo, but a video with an attractive man or attractive woman will get more clicks. I mean, that's, that's the internet. Um, and that kind of stuff does not hurt. Um, the formalities in all this matter a good bit less. And that's why we say, you know, we're not looking for full business plans. We're not looking for full financial projections. You better know your business pretty well, and you better be able to respond robustly to the questions that investors ask. Um, but it's much more about creating sort of a sex appeal around the business than it is around creating a technical bit of, 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 of formal disclosure. So, that leads to the next point, which is that momentum is absolutely critical. Now, this graph here is a little bit old, um, but broadly speaking, it measures the chance of your hitting your target versus how much you've already raised. So as I said, about 15% of businesses that come onto Cedars hit their target. But of those that get even to 1% of their target, 27% go on and hit their, their full target. If you're up to 10% funded, you're more like 75%. And really, we've only had to date one business past 35% funded without then going on to reach 100%. It's an amazing thing, and there, there are a number of arguments behind why it happens. There is the investors are sheep argument, um, and there is some, there is some truth to that. Um, but there's also the really, really important point that people want to see deals that are hot. People want to see that you can go out there and drum up support from your networks and your extended contacts before they start putting money behind you as a complete stranger. And so that's why we say 
the key to momentum and really the key to crowdfunding all comes down to one word, and that's hustle. And again, this is just as true on Kickstarter as it is, as, as it is on Cedars. Um, and it's not, when I say hustle, it's not hustle in a graft kind of way. It's not a bad thing. It's going out there and it's selling yourself and it's marketing yourself. You know, the worst kept secret people often say about crowdfunding is that you have to bring your own crowd. And, and there's a statistic on Kickstarter that's incredibly interesting. 84% of Kickstarter pledges come from people who landed on the project page via an external link. So that means only 16% are people who are kind of browsing Kickstarter and are like, ooh, this looks cool, I'm going to fund it. 84% is because they heard about it through a blog, an email, a tweet, whatever. Now, you know, in equity, crowdfunding is a little different. We have a base of investors who are always looking for new deals, and I think the numbers are probably, we don't have the exact one, I think we're probably closer to 50-50 or something like that. But the principle is the same. You have to be prepared to drive people to your campaign. Um, and again, I mean, this is, this is just as much about investors wanting to back things that other people are backing as it is the fact there's a bit of a herd mentality. So how do you do it? The, 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 the first point is that it's not, and, and I think this is, you know, in all candor, a mistake that we made when we first started talking about this and when we first launched. We said, get your friends and family to invest. Well, actually, Friends and family are nice. Like, it's great. If you can get your mom to put 50 quid in or, you know, get a friend to put 100, 100 quid in, that, that's a good start. Um, but that's rarely enough. This is much more about extended networks. This is about your social media contacts and their social media contacts, getting your friends and people to share with their networks. It's also about communities of shared interest. I mean, I, I don't know if this, is, if this was part of Emily's strategy, but if I were building something like what Emily did, which is a, a, a new type of bike light, I would be out there hitting all blogs, forums, etc., of interest to cyclists. This is a great new product. If anybody who wasn't here for Emily's presentation, by the way, she's built an awesome bike light that projects a little image of a bike ahead so it helps avoid a tipper truck, truck turning into you and crushing you. But, you know, that's something that a lot of cyclists care about. Most cyclists don't like to be crushed by tipper trucks. Um, and so be, going out to that community uh, and reaching out to them and getting them excited, very, very important. In almost any business, you will have a community of shared interest around you and reaching out to them is critical. So what we say in terms of effective approaches is go to networking events, talk to people, talk up what you're doing. You know, there's always people sometimes feel a little odd about talking about money, but there's a very straightforward way to do this. You simply go, you meet people, you, in the conversation about what you're doing, you, you talk about your passion, and then toward the end you say, oh, and by the way, if you're interested in what we're doing, we're raising some money through Cedars. We're raising some money through Kickstarter. Here's a little card I've had printed. Go check out our campaign. It's a very, very easy way to do things. People, if they don't want to fund you, they won't fund you. But it's a very, very, very effective approach to try. Getting your friends to reach out to their social networks is, is as critical. Doing your own PR is important. Getting blogs and papers and others to write about you is really, really, really useful. And they will. Crowdfunding is still kind of a new enough thing um, that particularly when you have something really interesting and exciting to share about what you're doing, you can often get it. And they will talk about the fact that you're raising money. And that will drive traffic as well. And really, just anything else, anything that is ethical and above board but that represents good salesmanship is important. And I think that. You know, part of this and part of the reason that going out there and being a salesman is important is that that's what you're going to have to do as you grow your business anyway. R whether you're in B2B or B2C, no matter what your mark go-to-market strategy is, you're going to have to sell yourself a number of different times to a number of different types of people. You have to sell yourself to new employees. You're going to have to sell yourself to customers. You're going to have to sell yourself to many others. And so the experience of going out and selling yourself to a crowd of investors is a great indicator of potential success, and it's also great practice. So I'm going to finish on this point, which is to say that there's one clear message behind equity crowdfunding, and I would say crowdfunding in general, which is that if you build a pitch that is articulate, that's thoughtful, and that's engaging, and that shows how much you've already thought about the space, and you're willing to go out and work harder than you've ever worked before to raise the money, you will succeed. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Do stay up? Or? Okay, do it. Goodbye. Cool. Thank you very, very much, Jeff. Um, so many ins and outs about telling the story. Again, I think we've kind of heard this point several times with the investors, the pitching, the networking. It really is key to kind of understand your story of business, what it is you're actually trying to communicate. So lots of people will tell you that great businesses are a bit like storytelling. In some ways, that's kind of true in the fact you do need to have a sort of a beginning, a middle, and an end, especially when it comes to investment. It's really important to kind of think in these terms. You know, we talked about Dale with her exit strategy. You know, people do want to know you've thought it all through. 
However, some businesses, especially social businesses, businesses that want to change the world for positive good, can sometimes be a lot harder to understand quite how they monetize, quite how they fit in, quite how they make sense. So we have um, the fantastic Dan Such from Nominet here to come and talk to you about the sort of funding streams that are available. These are often funding streams released either from uh, very interested philanthropic partners such as Nominet, or alternatively the government and increasingly the EU. There's lots of funding streams that are available to entrepreneurs, especially if you're doing social good stuff. But how do you get to them and how do you understand them and how do you apply? So if um, you'd like to join me in welcoming Dan to the stage, he'll be talking you through this process in some detail. Thanks, man. Do you want to set that up? Uh, does anyone want some more water whilst we're setting up? It's thirsty work. It's warm in here. No? We've got more water to give away than anywhere else. I'll, I'll just use it as something to fall over during my presentation. <laughs> it's going to happen at some point. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, man. Fantastic. Guys, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, so I guess the title of this is about finding the right way, finding other ways to make your aspirations, your business, your ventures work. So I'm going to give you, I hope, an introduction to something that perhaps you haven't considered, perhaps something that's a little bit surprising for, for new startups, but I hope it will give you another insight into another way in which you can kickstart this approach, kickstart your venture, and make it a success. But before I do that, can I just get a, a show of hands? So who here is kind of at a really early stage? Who's a kind of startup? Who's got some ideas? OK, the majority, brilliant. This is the important question. This is the one that decides whether we carry on with the presentation or not. <laughs> I shouldn't have added it. No. Who here has got an idea that thinks that has something to do with creating some social value? Who thinks you've got a social business, you're trying to do some good in the world, or, and this is really important, you are developing a technology that you think might be used by other people to make their world better? OK, brilliant. That's a good start. OK, so let's go for this then, and we'll see how we get on. This will apply to not just those who've got kind of social objectives in mind, but if you think about some of the big technologies that most of us will be familiar with, things like Facebook and Twitter, they are being reappropriated all the time for social ends, to make the world a better place for certain people. Charities are using Facebook like you wouldn't believe, and Twitter and the like. So think about your startup now. Think about potential uses and also how it might fork later on, how other social purposes, social benefits can be used from it. But this is us. This is Nominate Trust. This is what we believe and what we're trying to do. We've got a fundamental belief that the use of digital technology, the way in which we create digital technologies, can be used to make the world a better place. It's a lovely place to start with. We can use and create digital technologies that address some of the big challenges that are faced by ourselves and by our communities. Now, we're here to support people who believe in that mission who are creating new ventures, new businesses, new, organisa uh, new organizations who want to address that mission and, and see it become real. We are the foundation charity of Nominet, the organization that looks after the .uk domain registry. And because of their membership, the strength of their membership, because of the efficiencies of their staff, we're, we are able to invest about five million pounds a year in organizations who are trying to develop new approaches, new uses of digital technology for social good. Now, we also recognize that it's quite a difficult thing to do. And although our aspiration is to make the world a better place, just as I'm sure your aspiration is to make an incredibly successful organization, we know that's a long track. We know that's a difficult thing to do. So actually, our first target, our first ambition, is just demonstrate where technology can be used for social good. Once we can demonstrate the potential, we look then to help develop it further and actually begin to realize some of those social benefits, some of the social value. Now, a lot of the work we do is what you would class as traditional grant making. We give out grants to amazing organizations who are trying to create better lives for people. Some of those big organizations, you'll, some of those logos you'll, you'll recognize. We work with existing charities. We work with existing social entrepreneurs. But we also support for-profit organizations. And that's what I want to focus on today, is not just focusing on how do we support big charities or how do we support charities use technology more effectively, but how do we support organizations who are trying to create brand new ventures, individuals who are trying to create brand new ventures that use technology either directly for social value or that are developing technologies they think can be used by others to make their lives a better place. And there are some on the board there that didn't necessarily start out as social ventures. Some of them did. But they're using technology in really imaginative ways, from trying to find, help young people find jobs in a really complex job market 
to helping core workers who work for local authorities to work with complex families, to develop tools that support people's mental health and well-being. There's a whole range of people who are trying to develop businesses around the use of social technology or creating social technologies for good. Now, the reason we've got this belief is that, it, that technology can be used to transform some of the social challenges we're looking to address, is that we've seen the, the, the use of technology in other sectors where it's completely changed the market. It's completely changed the way in which people operate. Now, I could have put up 100 different logos, but we know how some online shopping has changed the way in which many people shop, has changed the look of a high street in some ways. We know that some of the online tools have changed the way in which people communicate and how that's had an effect on people's lives. They've really transformed markets, created brand new markets, as well as subverting existing ones. And at the heart of it is that amazing uh, straight line, that curve, which is saying that technology is getting cheaper and cheaper, or it's getting more and more powerful at the same size. And we have this amazing opportunity. If people have this remarkable technology in their pockets, if more and more people have access to incredible technologies that you guys can create, how can we ensure their lives get better? How can we take advantage of that to make the world a better place? It's a lovely place to start with. And futurists get really excited by that top corner, which is the technology that all of you will have in your pockets and most people have outside is more powerful than the stuff that NASA had to put man on the moon and bring them back safely in about 1970. That's really out of date. The pen that I use has more computational power than the technology that, that NASA had to put man on the moon and bring back safely. My pen. We have this such incredible potential in our pockets. Surely we can use it. Surely we can design it to help people have better lives. Surely. I guess you start off with, if we've got that incredible computational power in our pockets, why on earth aren't we just flying to the moon every night? Why aren't we just dropping up and down whenever it's our time? And the reason is, it's not just the technology that's going to help us to get there. It's that list of attributes at the bottom, which is what I'm kind of hoping you've brought to today, which is the creativity, the willingness to take risks, the, the entrepreneurship, the hope, the aspiration of creating something new. And we know that it's really difficult to have all of those things, but this is what the entrepreneurs are that we're looking to support. And if you can see yourself in that bottom list of characteristics, and you think you can develop some new technologies that support other people to improve their lives, then grant funding could well be a way for you to access and begin to build your dream. Now, what we don't look to do is add technology to existing things that happen. We're looking at creating brand new technologies, creating brand new ventures that shift the way in which technology is being used. And this diagram kind of shows where we're looking to support people. And it's the middle of that Venn diagram, which is the best uses of technology, the best ways in which we can use technology linked with those characteristics that social entrepreneurs have, and then designing from there about how we might better address, the use, uh, might better address some of the social challenges that we're facing. It's not saying, well, we've got this really cool idea and we'll add a bit of tech to it. It's saying, what happens if we really think about how technologies can be designed and made, and we really apply them to a social challenge? How might we realize some social value? But if we're going to look for brand new approaches to the use and development of technology, then it means we need to find better ways of funding. We need to find new ways that don't just rely on traditional approaches to addressing social challenges. And actually, crowdsourcing is just an amazing example of that, where new entrants can come and help support people, uh, so support new projects, support new ventures, where the, the user might say, I want to see that happen. I want to get involved in it. But there also are another kind of new, I call it a hybrid form of investment, which is what Nominate Trust really focuses on. And that's its hybrid form in that we give grants and the benefits of grants as a financial instrument, which is no equity stake, no loan to replay, it's a gift of money. But we do it with an investor mindset because we realize that just giving money to good people doesn't always make successful ventures. And I'm sure that whole list of people who have come up with amazing dreams in the past who haven't quite made it isn't because they're not remarkably talented. It's not because their idea wasn't working. It's just that something else didn't necessarily quite gel. And it might be the networks they haven't quite been able to crash into. It might be the introductions that weren't quite made. Again, it's another real value of, crowds of crowds crowdfunding. That you extend your network immediately in terms of who's going to get involved. So we're looking at how we can get involved with an investor mindset of supporting people beyond the money, but with a very, very low risk grant. It sounds almost like a little bit too good to be true, but we'll see what that means. Now, the purpose of doing this, the purpose of the way in which we give funding grants and all this extra support 
is to begin with just to focus on those three things, just to help you develop those three things. We're not looking for you to change the world just yet, maybe in seven to 10 years. But for now, it's just testing out those propositions. And just as Jeff said, we're not expecting when you come to us that you have a fully formed business plan, partly because if you've written it and you've only kind of early stages of your, of your business, it's not going to be real anyway. We do want you to have a, a think, an assumption of how it might grow, but we want you to test out, and the grant funding and that support is to test out the social value. Why is this a good thing? Why is it important? How is it going to make the world a better place for one person, for a community, for a country, for the world? The user value, it doesn't matter how wonderful and how needed your project is, if you haven't got a user value, then there's no demand. If you haven't got demand, it's going to be a beautiful project that no one uses. So you need to test out, will people use this? Why will people use this? What's the proposition to them? And obviously the economic value. Now the good thing about grant funding is that economic value can take longer to, um, to be found. So grant funding can come in earlier for you to test out that early idea and say, look, we think that we can get this person or this group to pay for it. We think that's our kind of assumption. And it might be an assumption you have that's too early for other investors to get involved in, but grant funding can be there to allow you to test it out. So what does that actually mean? Well, I'm going to give you one example in detail of a fund that's open now. And actually, the deadline for the fund is only about a week away, so it's worth looking at. And it's called Social Tech, Social Change. And it's being run in, um, uh, with, with support from Founders Forum for Good. Does anyone here know Founders Forum? OK, so Founders Forum is a collection of amazing entrepreneurs who have built some of the most successful kind of global businesses. Founders Forum for Good is a subset of those people who are trying to understand how they can better support social entrepreneurs, how they can support people to use technology to make the world a better place. It's read, uh, um, led by people like uh, Martha Lane Fox, involved people like Jimmy Wales. And in working with them, in addition to grant funding that we can give to for-profit or not-profit organizations, we can also provide incredible mentors who are incredibly successful. The people who operate within Founders Forum for Good are offering their services to support early stage ventures. It's quite a nice offer, I hope. But it's also that really early stage. Again, a bit like Jeff was talking about. We're not after just an idea that you've written on the back of a napkin. That's for someone else. We're not looking for things that have been proven. We're looking for something that has, that you've tested the idea out in some way, ideally with your potential users. Now, that can be a flaky prototype. It can be a paper prototype. But you're just getting some real feedback from the people who you want to be using this. So it's pretty early stage. It's pretty much your seed stage investment. But it's grant funding with the support. And all we're looking to do with this funding is not, uh, is not see a financial return. It's not for you to have established a business necessarily. It's for you to have demonstrated the potential, which means we need to understand what do you need to build to test out those three core propositions, your user value, your social value, your economic value. What do you need to create so you can begin to get a bit more evidence, a bit more confidence that you're going in the right direction? It's not a hard push. Now, to get there, and I've just copied this from the website, and it's worth having a look, there's a list of attributes that we're looking for, and it's not that much. It's just that you have tested your idea out in some way, or you're an existing team that's tested before, and you've got a new idea. Ideally, you've had some seed funding, and it might be that you've just put 5K into it yourself, or from your grandparents or whoever, or you've raised some small amount of money from, from, from friends and family. Or it could be that you just began to test the prototype because you've been working on it in evenings and weekends. It's the sort of thing that keeps you awake at night because you're so passionate about it. But you've got to that stage where you've got a, something that you can test with other people. Paper prototype, working flaky, held together with sticky tape to prototype. But along with that, you've got an aspiration to use this to create some social value, to make the world a better place. Now, if you have those things and you can work out what you can do in a year to test out your propositions, then this is the sort of funding, I think, that should be of interest to you. And the reason is you get around £50,000, depending on what you need. You get the support to go out and test. We have brilliant people at the Trust, as well as networks we can link into that help you develop your idea to test out those three propositions, to build the tools, build the technologies you need. Uh, and roughly within a year's worth of funding, free funding, free money, lots of support, because we want to support the most amazing social tech organisations in the UK. And we're in a real position now where you've got incredible tech startups, and you're some of them. You know, we're not too far away from East London where they're even more burgeoning. We've got an incredible history in the UK of social activities trying to make a better place. And if those two things come together, 
then we're going to have some remarkable new businesses that we should be really proud of. And if we can find ways of supporting them now, especially that early stage with something like a 50k investment, then we're up and running. Now, the pitch for the grant funding, rather than other types of funding that's available, or that you can try for, is it's generally a little bit earlier stage if you talk to a progressive grant funder like Nominet Trust. It's also where we recognize there's a slower growth curve for social tech organizations. And if you need that, that longer period of time to develop those three propositions, then grant funding makes it slightly less risky with no equity stake but all the support. But it also is about helping you articulate your business in a way, or articulate your venture in a way, that gets other people in, interested in the future. We talk about de-risking future investment. So how can you work through a grant funding program, develop your proposition to an extent that you can go to someone else to get further investment, or you can take it straight to market? Now, we do have uh, two other funds that's worth talking about, and I'm going to talk about them really briefly. And that's because we see them as a kind of pipeline of development. So that fund I've just talked about, Social Tech, Social Change, is focused on really early stage ventures, kind of seed stage ventures. And we have other funds then to help develop it further if you can begin to test that proposition. It's not just a one-off grant. If it seems to be working well, we can put more funds into what you're doing. We can try and create uh, better networks and links for you. But we have one fund which is interested for anyone who's working with young people called Digital Edge. And this has come about because we recognize there are particular ways in which you can use technology that really overlay with some social challenges that are taking place at the moment. Basically, these are really ripe areas for new innovation, for new entrants to get involved. So if you're quite good, if you have something that could be used by young people, you're quite good at creating technology, you've got some really good ideas, and they link into these three areas, then there's further funding available. And this is generally kind of 100K plus size grants. But it's about finding new ways of engaging with young people. It's about finding new ways for them to be economically active, or to find new ways of understanding what young people are doing to inform policymakers. So if you've got a great data mining idea, that could well be used uh, within the digital edge. If you've got a great way of un collecting together people's voices and ideas and then presenting them to another audience, then that could be something that could be used for social good. There are lots of opportunities in these where there's great potential in the use of tech, but we need people who've got the imagination and the creativity to come up with how they might realize them for social good. So if you can see yourself in any of those three, you should come and talk to me afterwards. The other one where there's a huge change, huge opportunity, sorry, for, for the use of digital technology is life transitions. When people go through moments of change, becoming unemployed, becoming employed, moving into retirement, moving house, leaving school, any time you go through a big change, it's very often then that we need access to new information, access to new communities, access to new support. Technology is really good at those three things online communities, accessing new information, providing links to new people to support you. If you're imaginative enough and creative enough that you can think of a tool that can support people through moments of transition, then again, there's grant funding available. We're particularly interested in those three, grant, uh, uh, moments of transition, those who help people through moments of transition, and transitioning in later life. Lots of opportunities, but it takes creative people with a great understanding of tech, who have got the drive to develop new businesses, Come and speak to me. And the last one I'm going to talk about, which has been on stage yesterday, is make things do stuff. And this is probably where most of the, the for-profit organizations we work with have been supported recently. And that's just about getting more young people involved in making stuff digitally, not just using stuff digitally. There's another fund that's going to be available from that at the end of the year, which is about helping people become uh, move from particular interest groups, maybe football or dancing, and shift that into something where they begin to make digital products. So if your passion is about making digital products, then this well could be somewhere you can get involved in grant funding, which helps you develop a product which has a social value, but you can also build a business on the back of it. Now, the important slide. If any of the stuff I've talked about, particularly the social tech, social change, which is the kind of 50K grant funding, plus the support of experienced entrepreneurs, there's a deadline next week, the 11th of September. It's pretty close. Now, one of the things that's often thought about grant funding is it's all about lots of paperwork. It takes a lot of time. It's actually not true. To apply for social tech, social change, it's about two sides of writing, about 10 questions. If you can't answer those questions, you're, you're not going to get money from anyone. Who are you? What's the point of your work? Why are you in the right position to do it? What's the need? How do you think you might begin to grow and test out your ideas? They're quite simple questions. And they're quite short forms, all online, 
if you know your business really well or your ideas really well, it will take you half an hour. Half an hour of your time, possibly for 50K. It's not bad payoff. Or if you don't know your business, then you have to go ahead and think about it a little bit more. But the questions are structured to help you think about how you might want to grow your business. So there's a misconception, I think, that grant funding is always for not-for-profits. If you seek out the more progressive grant funders, and you can think about how either your technology meets the objectives, this is kind of the social objectives, or you can think about how your technology can be used by others to create social value, then grant funding, especially from progressive grant funders, can offer you really low risk, essentially free funding with a lot of support. It's quite a new offer, I think, for for-profit organizations. It's quite a new offer for brand new ventures, but it's worth having a look at. So I'll be around later on. Uh, we'll stop there for now and we'll take some questions. But thank you all guys for, for coming. I hope it's been interesting and uh, we'll pick up some questions in a minute. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, we're gonna take some questions uh, available to both uh, Jeff and Dan um, now and then we're gonna kind of sort of explore a few themes and, and ideas um, about certainly um, maybe what both Dan and Jeff are seeing in terms of applications and, and those things that are getting funded. But I think we're gonna start with some of your questions first. Um, and I've been informed that two people who answered the best questions and I can't really believe that I'm offering this, but this is apparently uh, uh, something to offer, is uh, you can have a free ride on the Thames Clipper, um, which goes from Greenwich and goes all the way up through central London. Um, so I have um, four tickets. They are singles, so one, one there and one back. Um, for the best questions, um, if you haven't taken the Thames Clipper, it's actually bloody good fun. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so there's a free boat trip for the best question. I don't know if that's going to inspire you to ask the best question, but that doesn't really matter. Um, so yes, do we have any questions for either Dan or Jeff? Bearing in mind they're both successful entrepreneurs and talented people and they can answer all sorts of questions. You at the back there, sir. Uh, hi, I, I came a bit late, so you might already have answered it. Dan, can we see your pen, please? <laughs> <laughs> it's always asked. Yeah, it's just a live scribe. It's, uh, it's not a remarkably flash thing. It just shows how quickly technology has changed, I guess. It is quite cool. It's got, it's got a, uh, a small video camera, which means it tracks everything in my book. But what is it? OK, it's an expensive pen, 90 quid. But more technology there that NASA had to put man on the moon and bring back safely. It's just a, a, a signal, I guess, that the sorts of technology that are available to us, just surely, if we're thoughtful enough and creative enough, surely we can build businesses that are good for other people as well as ourselves. Well, right, thanks. Li live stripe. Yeah, live stripe. Yeah, uh, live stripe. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll stop with you. Hi, uh, Jeff. Could you tell us how Cedars got founded? <laughs> Absolutely. So my my co-founder and I were in business school together, and and we started talking about as part of an academic project uh, 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 the problems around seed finance and started building the model out from there. Um, and then we actually faced a, a, you know, the sort of meta problem of how do we fund ourselves to build this. And we used to joke all the time, God, if only we existed already, we could, we could fund the thing. Um, and it was really, really tough. And, and, and you know what, what the ultimate sort of tipping point for us was dumb luck. My, my co-founder's um, landlord happened to be an angel. He'd had a tech exit some years ago, and the two of them were talking one day in the hallway, and he was interested in what we were doing. He put in our first 30,000 pounds. That got us a little bit of progress, a little bit of traction. We did another angel round after that and so forth. And that, in many ways, <clears throat> reinforced even further for us how important what we were doing was, because that kind of dumb luck doesn't happen in most cases. Um, and having an organized way of getting that first seed capital makes so much more sense. Any more questions? Lovely, sir. Uh, a question for Jeff. Um, presumably you have a, a, a big database of uh, people who are willing to... Can you, um, therefore, um, angle a, uh, an offer towards people who are interested in a certain that's a, area? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great question. Um, so 
I'll give you the at scale answer, and then I'll give you the, 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 the today answer. At scale, we, we want to have something that looks a little bit like an Amazon recommendation engine. So every investor who logs into the platform based on the information that we have about them, what they've provided us, as well as what they've already invested in, sees a different group of startups on there that's most likely to appeal to them. And when, when we can get to the point of building that, and when we have enough data to build that, I think that's going to be really, really, really exciting. So watch this space for that feature. What we can do now is the MVP version of that. So we present startups to this. Everyone has the same view of, of, of startups when they log in. But we present the ones that are getting the most activity and most, uh, most traction first based on uh, uh, some algorithms we've designed. And then we also have search functionality. So if you want to look by particular category or by particular status or by particular tax relief, you can do so. So it's pretty easy to find what you want today. But we're a long way off being able to deliver to people what they want without them even knowing it. Dan, I wonder if um, you, have you ever thought about doing something similar with, with the sort of social good stuff and sort of trying to give, uh, you know, there's a lot of social entrepreneurs. There's also people like myself who like to sort of do good in some small possible way. Have you thought about taking the Cedars approach to the Nominet Trust? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great conversation to have. Uh, so far, we, we've, uh, we've supported uh, only one project so far that went through Kickstarter. And uh, due to the mechanism of uh, Kickstarter, using essentially credit cards. Yep. We couldn't fund them through that, but we made an agreement with them we could fund them uh, if they filled the gap. What's really exciting for me about uh, crowdfunding, and I mentioned it earlier, is uh, you get close to the people who might want to use the product to make the decision. And if, if part of that early stage venture is about proving the, the user value, the economic value, and the social value, if you can link to the people who are those people, the paying customers, people who want to use it, then, then you're there. So I think there's a real, uh, there's a, yeah, I guess, I guess the short answer is we would love to find another way of getting close to the user value at the application stage and maybe working with crowdfunding is one of them. Do we have any more questions? Yes, sir. So a question for Dan. Um, does the social value of an enterprise have to be the primary purpose of the business in order to be eligible or can it be a secondary or even unintended a, a byproduct of, yeah. of the profit? But that, that, that's, that's a brilliant question. It's, it's almost a clipper question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, just adding a recommendation. Uh, uh, so I think where we've shifted recently is it doesn't have to be the primary purpose. Uh, I, it, I don't think it can be un, un, unintended at the moment because you have, need to be able to articulate it. But there are lots of organisations who are creating incredible tools that are, have a social purpose as well as one that has, you know, that's going to get in their great big exit. Uh, I guess, yes, to get grant funding, you need to be able to articulate why you think it has social value. But that can only be a strand of the way in which your, your uh, organization develops. Any more questions? Oh, look at that. We'll start with you, lady. Uh, the question is for Jeff. Um, what uh, do you think is uh, the market size for crowdfunding? Uh, what market share do you have right now? Um, and um, uh, what are the barriers to entry uh, that your company has? All, all, all good questions. Globally, I think there are 30 million businesses that are eligible for equity crowdfunding. We've done 35 of them. I don't, my, my, ma my, my maths in my head aren't quite good enough to do the percentage, but we as of now have a very, very, very small market share. Um, the, 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 you know, the, 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 and the slightly broader sort of color around that answer is to say that the, 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 one of the things that I love and, and that as a business we are passionate about with equity crowdfunding is it is not just for the next Facebooks and the next Googles. It's great to, those are, it's great to fund businesses, those kinds of businesses, but any business that has growth ambitions, any business for which equity can be used, uh, can use crowdfunding. We funded a wonderful cheese maker in Northern Ireland called Mike's Fancy Cheese. We funded a bakery, Sir F's Patisserie. Um, there are loads and loads of different types of businesses uh, that can be funded. And so we see this as a, an absolutely gigantic universe. And in, ma in, many, in many ways, you know, we don't even see crowdfunding as an industry or as a market. It is the, it is a, a, we are in the very, very early iterations of what we think will become the standard types of methodology around funding businesses 
uh, in the 21st century. Um, in terms of barriers to entry, the main one is regulatory. Uh, so we're authorized by the Financial Conduct Authority, uh, which is the main financial regulator in the UK. We were the first platform actually to get regulated, equity platform to get regulated anywhere in the world. And our first three and a half years, um, when nobody was inviting me up onto stages and nobody ever heard of me, was working behind the scenes trying to get through that regulatory process. And there's a huge amount of uncertainty uh, that we would even do it. Um, we're, thankfully, uh, I think you know we carved a bit of a path and it's easier and easier now for people to get in, but it's still hard work. Um, and to some extent it should be. It's, you know, you're handling a platform like ours, we're handling people's money. Uh, we're doing a number of things that really do touch at what financial regulation is about. And there does need to be a certain amount of review and scrutiny, which I think is important. But I'm, I'm glad to see it getting much better than it was when we did it. Hey, hi, I've got a question for Jeff. Yeah. Um, in terms of the actual application for CEDARS, do, do you guys like go through how a company articulates their project or is that based on the entrepreneur? So the entrepreneur submits and, 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 and our starting principle is to say that, you know, we, we're, we're happy to have you say what you want to say about your business. We're not there uh, to tell you how to do it. Uh, we'll give you tips and pointers and some advice. There's some legal bits we have to do about confirming if you say something factual, we have to see evidence of it and, and bits and bobs. But for the most part, uh, we try to leave that as much up to the entrepreneur as we can. Okay, sure, thanks. Ooh, right at the back there, that was a good, strong sort of arm in the air, I like that. Right up here. Um, hi guys, both. Thank you for your presentations. Um, one question that I have is around the B2B to B2C type of divide. Uh, presumably, or my assumption is that B2C is much more popular, a much more successful model when doing a crowdsource because of the anonymous uh, market share that you have to go out to versus a B2B proposition that is a much more direct sales type of play. Is that true? Is it false? So, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's from, our, from our end, it's something we've looked at very closely. And I, I, it, it's not that far off, but I think the divide we see is a slightly different one. It's not really B2C versus B2B, so much as stuff that people get versus stuff that people don't get. I mean, and, and it's a very sort of silly way of saying it, but what works well on crowdfunding platforms tend to be uh, businesses and ideas that ordinary people from all walks of life can kind of connect with. And very often those are consumer propositions and very often sort of big complex enterprise sales propositions aren't going to be in that category. So there is some overlap. Um, but there's some really interesting exceptions. I mean, one, one just to, to highlight, we have a business funded through us called Satego, and they are doing fintech credit analytics for small businesses. A re I mean, it's, it's, it's really a B2B play, um, and it, it, a highly technical one at that. But I think one of the things that led them to succeed in funding is that the, the whole purpose and the whole thing they built up around has been late payments to small businesses and the effects on those businesses' cash flow. And that's something that a lot of people understand and feel the pain of. They either own their own small businesses, they have friends who own small businesses, big suppliers fail to pay for 90 days and that really screws over their cash flow. And so even though it was a B2B sort of techie play that doesn't necessarily fit normally within what works on crowdfunding, it worked because it was something that connected with people emotionally. So yeah, I think there is a, it, it, there's a, a bit of a kind of B2C versus B2B, but it's more about what connects with people and what doesn't. Awesome. Any more questions? Lovely. There's one down the front. Hello. Uh, this is a question for uh, Jeff, I guess. Um, you mentioned that 15% got funded on Cedars, and I presume that more don't get funded, not just because it's a bad product, perhaps, or a bad idea, but because actually some of the offers represent bad value. Yeah. Um, so people don't want to take it up. So firstly, is that a problem? And secondly, I guess more importantly, um, what is your advice for avoiding giving a bad value proposition when actually what you're trying to do is value something which doesn't exist. Right. Well, so it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I didn't really get into valuation, but, you know, valuation of seed stage businesses is, it's not only more art than science. I mean, it's abstract art. It's, it's a Jackson Pollock. I mean, it is not uh, something that there are any clear rules on. Um, to the first question, yes, we absolutely do have businesses that I think potentially could have gotten funded at a lower valuation, but don't get funded. And we see it. We see it in the Q&A forum. We will see investors step in and say, 
look, I like what you're doing, but not at this price. At a different price, I would have considered it. So it absolutely does happen. The best that can be done and what we try to do is give as much guidance up front to entrepreneurs about what investors tend to expect in the way of value. And there are, while there is no science to it, there are rules of thumb. There are kind of views that if you're doing business here, it's, you've accomplished a certain amount, you're at a certain stage, certain ranges of value or what pe valuation or what people expect to see. Sometimes that's a painful number. Sometimes people come in thinking that they're going to raise 50,000 pounds and only give away 5% of their business. And we're saying, no, you really are going to need to give away 25% for where you are. And ultimately, we let everybody choose if they want to stick with a higher valuation they can. Um, but we do try to guide because you're absolutely right. We want, we, you know, a lot of these, a lot of companies have great potential and we want to see them get funded. Um, and it's a shame when valuation is what, what, what gets in the way. Do we have any more for any more? Oh, sorry, of course, sir. Um, I'm just trying to uh, understand a bit more about the crowdsourcing. I don't know what the average sum that people might commit is, but say hundred pounds. No. So it's. I'll, I'll tell you on us. It's um, six hundred and thirty-one pounds is the average, but a hundred pounds is the median. Okay. Well, if someone commits, say. 400 pounds, they might hope to get a return of 10%, say, 40 pounds. So that makes me think, are they really doing this because actually they, they want to help something rather than actually make money out of it? Well, it's, it's an interesting one. I mean, I think, I think the one return that you're very unlikely to get when you invest in a startup is 10%. You usually get 0% or a thousand percent or more. Um, and so I think that what people are often investing in, even when it's reasonably small amounts of money, uh, is, a, you know, is the potential of a really quite big upside relative to what they've invested. I think the, the important point, the second point is, it's about portfolio diversification. So many people who are putting in 100 or 200 pounds per business are actually allocating thousands and thousands of pounds to the, this asset class, but they're doing it the way you should, which is investing in 50 or 100 different businesses. All that said, I think people come at this with mixed motivations. Financial is part of it, um, but investors who use platforms like ours, I think are there partially because they enjoy it, it's exciting, they're backing projects and businesses they care about, partially because they want to back particular individual people, but with a strong financial component as well. And if I may ask a final one, just yeah. as a matter of interest, yeah. which country produces the most crowd, as it were, America? Well, so, so on equity crowdfunding, Britain is the world leader. Um, and, it's, and that's partially because the regulatory situation in America is so complex and, and, and re restrictive uh, that, that uh, Britain was able to gain the advantage. And when we set out to launch or work on Cedars in 2009, we looked at America as a target market and just said no way for commercial reasons, but also for, um, for, for um, uh, uh, regulatory reasons. So the UK is the short answer. Um, on rewards-based crowdfunding like Kickstarter, it, it is the US. Guys, I'm just going to ask a question of both of you in a second, so be prepared. But I just wanted to share a little bit of observation from the work that I've done with Wira over the last 18 months or so. Number one, grants are bloody awesome. You don't give away any equity. So absolutely do your homework and see what options there are in your markets to see where you can get hold of those kind of things particularly if you're at the, the, the very, very early stage, which I know a good chunk of you are, that's the best way to get your business started. You don't have to give away anything in your business f in order to get that money, and it gets you cracking really, really quickly. From a crowdfunding perspective, just wanted to share a couple of other observations. Number one, on average, trying to secure a round of funding from an angel investor will probably take around about four months, end to end. It just takes time. There's a term sheet, there's legals, there's toing and froing. You wanna change a, con a, a, ter a term in the contract, it's, it just takes a long time to get through it. On the crowdfunding side, um, one of our startups last year who went through Cedars actually managed to get 150,000 pounds in 21 days. Just think about how quickly that accelerates you being able to get access to the funding you need. So just keep that in mind as well. The other thing about crowdfunding 
it allows you to be able to grow your network of fans really, really quickly. So the business that we talked about just then, they're called Pixelpin. In that 150,000 round, they were 192 individual yep. investors. That's 192 fans, as well as people who've given you money. It's an extraordinary way, not just to get your funding, but equally to secure marketing. So keep that in mind. Now, my questions for you guys. I mentioned that some of the people in the audience aren't necessarily from the UK. So questions for both of you are, what options do you think exist out there within the European Union? And also for Jeff afterwards is to then consider what, what expansion plans do you have for Cedars? Great, I'll go first. Okay. So I've, if you're looking at grant funding uh, as, um, as a starting point, I think there's something that Ben mentioned at the beginning. There's, there's a, a, a real interest from the European Union at the moment about funding startups, not just social startups, but startups. And so if you look at the European Union funding, there's just lots and lots coming out to help. In fact, this year, I believe, is the year of the European startup. So if you're interested in finding grant funding to kickstart your, your work, I think that's the first place to look. And I'll, um, I'll post a link later on about where you can find that on a, on a URL. Um, Crowdfunding. Uh, there are platforms uh, elsewhere in Europe, mostly national, uh, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, France, Italy, and others uh, do have platforms. By and large, they're fairly small. There are some good ones. Netherlands has a platform called Simbid, which, which I, I, I like very much, and, and, and there are a few others out there. Everybody with slightly different approaches. Um, but it won't surprise you to hear that I don't want you to use them. I want you to use us. Um, and in the very, very near future, uh, we are going to be open Europe-wide. Uh, and we'll be open to businesses and to investors throughout the EU and, 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 and Switzerland, EEA, et cetera. Um, there are complexities, um, and it's worth just sort of highlighting that you know, the kinds of things that, that, that you need to think about when you're raising money cross-border uh, are language or payments um, and even structure. Uh, so we do what many, what many UK uh, investors do, which is ask companies to put a UK top co or holding company in place. It's very easy to do, um, but we do ask that. But within the next few months, we will be available throughout Europe. And for those of you who are thinking about crowdfunding and, and aren't based in the UK, be patient. Um, we'll be there very soon. <laughs> you, you satisfied with the answer? You can't get a Thames Clipper, by the way. Do you know that? I'm sorry. Um, do we have any other questions from the crowd? I have a few I would like to ask, but I uh, wanted to see if anyone... Oh, lovely. Uh, a question to Jeff. Yeah. Um, how do you exit the business? So you're in the exact same position as an investor uh, as you would be as an angel or a venture capitalist, which is that you, know, you are in principle waiting for a trade sale, an IPO, a management buyout, or any other form of exit event, or for businesses that are going to go on and operate for a period, uh, dividends or management buybacks. So it's a you know investors are put in that position, the same position as they always are, and and there is it's a long time horizon, and it's important for investors to appreciate they're investing for a long term. Um, there is a, you know there there can be opportunities to sell earlier, to sell shares to other investors. Um, but we tend not to sort of make a big deal out of those because uh, they're pretty rare. You know, there's often a lot of talk about secondary markets uh, for early stage companies. Um, but that's really not what investing in startups is about. Investing in startups is about, you know, investing for the long term and, and waiting for a significant corporate event to, to, to realize your money. So, oh, got a question on the side, lovely. And then you will come back to you. Okay. You're really warming up with this question stuff, aren't you? It's the prizes, I think. Hi, uh, I just wanted to, so you said like that crowdfunding is a very uh, new uh, sector and in industry. Uh, <clears throat> what do you think about investors who invest today? Uh, even if you tell them, okay, it's a very risky business, uh, be careful, uh, it's for the long term. What do you think they would uh, say when they will actually realize it was a risky business in what, like three, four, five years when they would have lost everything? So. It's a great question. Um, and the short answer is there will be people 
who are unhappy. There are loads of people who are unhappy on Kickstarter when, you know, that when the risks get realized there and a product doesn't come through. Um, but I think we do, and I think particularly, say, compared to Kickstarter, uh, we do a lot more to prepare investors and to go beyond just sort of telling them about the risk. So to invest through Seders, one of the things you have to do is complete a quiz that actually demonstrates to us by getting the answers right uh, that you really do understand the risks involved, you understand illiquidity. This isn't just about ticking boxes and saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually do impose a series of significant, a, 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 real, a significant screening process. We also cap how much you can invest based on your net assets, so there's no way you're going to wind up investing more than you can afford to lose. And I, I think that that serves two purposes. One is it screens out people and, it, and, it, and it serves as a backstop. But perhaps more importantly, it really does reinforce to people that this is about serious investing. Um, and my experience with investors through the years, and I've seen the investment world from a whole different number of different angles, is that, you know what, investors are smart. You know, people, people often sort of think that there's a, a need to be overly paternalistic and protect investors from themselves. It's very important that systems and controls are in place. It's very important that the right kinds of screening and, and disclosures are in place. But when you do that, I think by and large, the investors are big boys and girls, and they, they tend to be pretty well prepared for what they're getting into. Uh, we had a question at the front, didn't we? Yep, lovely. Uh, hi, Jeff. Um, I think you mentioned an algorithm before. That, yeah. Um, what criteria does your algorithm look for? That is a very good question. Um, and I don't have the full answer. What we're looking at, what, and, 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 you know, and I, if my co-founder were here, he could, he could tell you. But the core of it is, it's what we call a trending algorithm, and it's a combination of how much has been invested over a certain period of time with various different discount weights, how many different investors have invested, I think maybe some combination of page views and a few other things. And what we're trying to get, we, internally we call it the hotness factor. We're just trying to get a sense of which deals are getting the most attention. Do we have any more? Oh, we have Will at the back. Yeah. How are you? Uh, apologies if this has already been covered. I did turn up late. Sorry about that. Um, I wondered, uh, what is the worst thing about crowdfunding, both from the startup's point of view and from an investor's point of view? So from the startup's point of view, it's the risk of public failure. You know, for all of the difficulties in trying to raise money, particularly seed money offline, the one thing that's kind of nice about it is, op is, is that it's opaque. And then if everybody turns you down, you can sort of go on to the next group of people without anybody actually knowing that. And you know, I think a lot of people take advantage of that, and, and it, it is something. When you put yourself out to the public, you get all the benefits of validation, you get all the benefits of support, but you also get the problems of being non-validated. And you know, I don't think it's a particular killer, and I think there are lots of pe reasons people fail to succeed at raising money through crowdfunding. But whatever they are, it is public, and that's a risk, and that's something that one has to consider. From the investor's perspective, the risks really are what they say they are, which is this is a very high-risk asset class. These are investments that are most likely to fail. And for some people, that's an unusual thing to buy something where I know that there's more than a 50% chance I'm not getting my money back. Um, and being prepared, you know, talked about this in the previous question too, making sure that investors are prepared and understand how this asset class performs and the fact that it is about taking high risks, but in turn potentially getting high rewards um, is critical. Um, in the end, I think it's, it, it works very well, but that's, that's, the, that's the investor risk. I think just to follow up on the startup risk as well, uh, again, one of our startups last year also went on to Cedars and didn't yep. secure their funding. What it did for them, though, it was a really big wake-up call to go, have we really valued ourselves correctly? Have we really understood exactly what our customers want? And equally, is our business right to put onto something like a crowdfunding platform? And when they took that learning back, they realized actually that through the process of listing themselves on Cedars, they learn a crap load about what they should do differently. So even if you go onto a crowdfunding site and it doesn't quite work for you, you should still make sure that you use the learnings. It's not a failure, it's only a failure if you don't learn from what your mistakes are. That's an excellent point. Um, do we have any more questions? Okay, I'm gonna see if I can win a few boat ride up the Thames. So, Jeff, you, you sort of 
created this platform that's created some fantastic businesses. I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about some of your favorites and why. You mentioned the cheese. Yeah. Though, I mean, that doesn't seem a particularly technologically complicated uh, idea. And I'm just kind of wondering what it is about these sorts of businesses that excite you. So at one, you know, it's a, it's a great question, Ben. I, you know, at one level, um, you know, I sort of feel they're all my children, hard to, hard to, choose, hard, hard to choose favorites. But a, a couple of the really interesting ones, you mentioned the cheese one, and, and I'll start with, uh, with, with that. Mike's Fancy Cheese. So Mike Thompson uh, is this fantastic guy. He's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a young chap from Northern Ireland, uh, and he loves cheese. He's passionate about it, and he spent the last six or seven years working in delicatessens, working in cheesemakers um, in England and, and in, in Ireland. Um, and one of the things that he's realized uh, or he learned is that North, nobody was making a blue cheese in Northern Ireland. Uh, and people would come into a shop he worked at in Belfast and ask for a local blue cheese, and he'd have to sell them something from England or from the Republic. And he thought this was a problem um, and decided to go off and make his own. And so he needed 80,000 pounds in order to purchase the equipment. Cheese making equipment isn't cheap. I guess, um, and um, uh, he needed the money, money to go off and purchase the equipment and start and start manufacturing the cheese. He is now the cheese is, in, is has been I, I, I don't know the the whole process, but it is in the process of being made, whatever the technical term for that is. Um, and I'm told I get my first taste in a few months. Um, what's particularly exciting about that, beyond the fact that I'm getting cheese, is that there it was an amazing community element to this. You know, Northern Ireland is a is an interesting place. It is not a place that one often associates with sort of innovation and optimism over the last 30 or 40 years. It's been it's had a very very tough ride. It is coming out of the political troubles, or pretty well out of the political troubles now. One of the things that I think was so powerful about his campaign was that a number of people in Northern Ireland, from the local media to distant contacts and other people, got behind him almost out of a sense, not just be, not even because they were passionate about the cheese business, but they were passionate about this young, optimistic entrepreneur who wanted to make a difference and wanted to build a native business in Northern Ireland. And that was really, really exciting and certainly one of my favorites. So that's one end and one type. Another, another favorite is one of our first businesses to fund, which was called Digital Spin. Uh, and what they what they are, were doing and are doing is is solving the problem of captures. Most of you will know the squiggly letters you have to type in to get past internet security. And, and they, they, they just had a very, very clever, simple observation. This is how simple business can be. They said, on most websites, the capture is an attrition point. People try it, they fail because the letters are too squiggly, and they don't get through. And so this is a way of losing traffic. What if you could develop a capture that not only reduced attrition, but created revenue for the website? And so they've repl they're replacing traditional captures with, ad with advertising-based puzzles. So people are able to do puzzles that are easier to solve, but also screen out bots. Um, and there's advertising incorporated. Um, awesome idea. Absolutely love it. And they went on. Um, m soon after raising money with us, they identified somebody else in the UK doing something similar. So the two of them merged. And they proceeded to raise an A round from Balderton and Passion, and they are growing and growing and growing and doing fantastic things. Um, and then I guess a third one, just to say, and 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 this, you know, it, 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 it's it's there's so many, but third one is is Anne mentioned uh, Pixelpin, uh, which was which was a wire startup that came to us. And one of the really exciting things about that was that was was the entrepreneurs. So. The main entrepreneur behind it is, is, is a man named Brian Taylor. He's in his 50s. He's a former soldier. He, do, he did uh, IT security work with GCHQ and Metropolitan Police and other places for a while. Um, and as the story goes, and then this was before he came to us, but the story goes when he first came to Wira, you know, he asked and kind of wondered, you know, am I too old to do a startup? Is this, do I really fit in in this community? Is this, it, does this make sense? And he got tremendous encouragement from Wira about, yes, absolutely. You've got an idea. You've got something you're passionate about. You can make it work. There is no one profile to what an entrepreneur looks like or who can create a great business. And what he has done with his team, with, with Jeff Anderson and a couple others, um, is built out a fantastic IT security play, replacing passwords with pictures where you click on bits of the picture uh, to let you through. Very, very highly secure. Mashable rated them the second most exciting startup in the UK a few months ago. Not in the least bit what you kind of think of in the way of sort of your typical founding team, but brilliant guys and an amazing business. So that's probably my third.
Thank you, thank you. And I think there's a, a key point, really, uh, something that I've often been asked and, and I've never known the answer is, what does an entrepreneur look like? And the answer is, we don't know, yeah. I think. So, Dan, we've sat together on a few sort of judging panels for uh, Make Thing Do Stuff, and yeah, we saw yeah. some fantastic projects come through. So I'm wondering, what have your favourite projects been so far with the Nominet Trust? Again, they're, they're a bit like children, probably too many to mention. We're, we're currently supporting about 60 different organisations, but from Make Things Do Stuff, that's a great uh, campaign to begin with. It involves organisations like Nesta and Mozilla, and it's all about getting young people making digital products and services, hopefully to become the next generation of, of, of digital entrepreneurs. Within there, there uh, let's pick out one who I, who I worked with just the other day, a group called Technology Will Save Us. They essentially create really great starter kits for people to make digital products from... Uh, 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 a kit that helps you, um, that uses a sensor to tell you when your plant needs watering, through to a lumophone, which converts light into sound, through Arduino starter kits and that kind of stuff. Really quite beautiful, lovely little products. Actually, you can buy most of the components online if you wanted to. All they're doing is, all they're doing, what they're doing is trying to find ways of helping young people get involved in making this stuff more easily. And it's just a really lovely way of getting more people involved in digital making. And they're building an incredible business. They're, they're, they're growing quite rapidly. So that, that's kind of at one end. We look at something like um, Task Squad. Do you know Task Rabbit? Task Rabbit way of, of making lots of uh, tasks aggregated for, for me, more people to use, uh, get involved in them. Uh, to kind of essentially kind of uh, outsource your task book. Task Squad is about making micro work opportunities for young people. It's a huge issue with over a million young people um, uh, unemployed at the moment. How can we find ways of enabling them to become economically active? How can organizations who don't want to uh, recruit full-time, how can we help them break down the tasks they need done into paid working opportunities? And how can we link the two together? And V Inspired, who are running that, are just on the way up. They're doing some great work. So I'll stick with those two for now. I think that you know, technology will save us. One is a particularly interesting example of of how sometimes, you know, I think the question was asked, you know, how much social good do you need to have in these? And actually, it's a little bit more like, what story can you tell about the impact of what you're trying to do? Because Technology Will Save Us is effectively a kit, a company. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, they, they, but the fact that they focus so strongly on the education, and that's their tar t target market, that's who they're approaching, that's what the benefit of their, of their existence is, it's able to tell a story about social good as well as being a fundamentally capitalist enterprise. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point. I think one of the, the challenges with grant funding is traditionally that was at the far end of charities who were doing things that are good and, and raising investment was at the right other end of people who wanted to earn money and never the two will come together. And that's just not the case. We know we need good but solid businesses who are doing things for the world, making the world a better place. Uh, we also know that, that big businesses need to have a social conscience, otherwise we end up with all sorts of mess like we have over the last kind of decade or so. But grant funding is available for organisations who want to make a real big amount of money. They want to earn well, they want to live well. But it's just doing it with a mindset that you're not ruining anybody else. <laughs> you're doing it with a social conscience. But where the two get a little bit closer, where you're doing something that is about selling great products, but can be directed at schools and young people, can be directed at those who, who, I don't know, who have low financial uh, literacy or whatever, then there's a whole range of new funding opportunities that are available to you. So it's worth just thinking about the product that you want to create, the business you want to create, and think, how else might this be used? What is the social value? Who could this be useful for? Because if you can work out that link, then all of a sudden you've got access to a whole range of other sorts of income, a whole range of other sorts of funding that come with a whole range of different sorts of um, uh, support, such as grants. Thank you. And so, Jeff, I mean, uh, and I'll ask the same question of Dan. You talked about what kind of makes a successful sort of campaign almost you know you know we you know, we've both talked about once it gets above 50 percent it's almost guaranteed that you're going to hit your money what if you were going to describe the absolute worst sort of uh, equity funding attempt that you've seen you don't need to name any names was there anything you've seen that kind of almost guarantees when you look at it that they're just not going to make any money I mean, the, the one guarantee in terms of, at least in terms of ability to, whether they'll succeed at raising their money, is that they're not prepared to do work for it. You know, the moment that an entrepreneur comes to us and says something to the effect of, oh, well, well finding investors is, is your job. I'm, I, I don't, I don't want to have to go out and chase down investors. Dead certain that they will not raise money, nor likely will they be successful business people. I mean, that, that is, you know, a, an absolute certainty. Um, 
once you get over that hurdle, uh, it becomes a much more varied picture. And some people have great ideas and do work hard for it, but just don't quite fund. Some people get a little bit lucky and they try, you know, all of a sudden, so, you know, they, they think that they're going to get lots of little investments and somebody just comes in and dumps 30,000 pounds into the deal, which we saw at one point out of nowhere. It can happen, um, but it never happens unless they're actually going out there and, work, and working hard for it. And I think that's as true in succeeding in raising money as it is in building the business. And Dan, um, you know, what, what is it that commonly you just think, oh, God? Yeah, it, it, it's a, the point that Jeff made earlier on, actually, which is understanding what investors are looking for. Mm. Just, just do a bit of research. That, that can be just looking at their website. It might be going further. So we have a whole kind of resource bank of stuff that we're thinking about, which is informing our investment decisions. And if you read the stuff that we're reading, that's going to help you articulate your work in a way that we kind of link to. But the main thing is make sure you know what the investors are after. If they're after you know, fast growth, big payout, then there's a certain sort yeah. of investor that's after you. If, they're after, if, you're, if you can find ones like Nominate Trust who are aware of, kind of the, the slow growth of social tech organizations and they're willing to support them, then, then go for it. But the, the organizations that are quite easy to say, we're not, just gonna, we're not funding this, is because they haven't really engaged with what we're trying to do. And they've just pitched something, they've heard the word technology and good, and they've thrown an idea and it hasn't met what we're after. So just do, just do the research and find out what investors are after. That's the, the key. I mean, I remember the, the panel that, that we sat on together. There was um, a, a fantastic organization run by some fantastic people. Um, and we desperately wanted to help them. We really desperately wanted to give them money. Everybody around the table wanted to give them money. All we needed to know in order to get this money out of them was they had to give us a figure, a number of people they thought they were going to help. And we, we asked this question and they said they couldn't give us an answer. We pointed out that the number was irrelevant to a certain extent, we just needed almost something to put in a form. And they were unable to provide this number and as such, didn't receive the money. So I think sometimes when you're dealing, especially with investors or even when networking, you will get a question that you'll try to avoid, that you'll try to walk around, that you'll try not to answer. And the reason is, that question is often there for a very strong reason. And if you keep hearing the same question, getting asked multiple times, either by the same person or different people, you're probably not answering that question. And it's actually probably going to be really, really key to your business that you actually do answer that. And I think, you know, I'm sure you can talk a little bit about that, that particular example. Well, actually, I remember it well. And the, the question there was about understanding their ambition and their ability to realize their ambition. And one of the things I mentioned earlier on is, you know, lots of the presentations we get are very good at saying, this is the need of what we want to do. We can change the world, but they haven't necessarily got the capacity or the skills to, to realize that ambition. And that's what that question was about. So how many people do you think you're going to work with this year? How many people are going to benefit? And that's about saying, well, you know, I think across this year, if I've got the pro site working right, and I can kind of engage with these, but it's, you know, it's going to be about 20 people. It's like, okay, so, so now we get a sense of what you think you can achieve, and that's fine. But being able to, uh, the, the questions are there not to trip you up. They're there because this is the sort of information that's important to make a good investment decision. And that one is about what's the aspiration and what's your abil ability to, to, to achieve it. And I think just, just very quickly, to, to, I mean, I couldn't agree, couldn't agree more with Dan with Ben. I mean, the, the, the invest, different types of investors want different information. There's often an assumption that there's one information package that works for all. Not true. You have to be able to respond to different requests. And being good and flexible and willing to respond to requests, even when you don't want to, is important. I'll give you a perfect example. Us as a business. We're, we're talking to the number of people about, about an investment in us at the moment. And we started to get a particular question about cost of customer acquisition and customer lifetime value and some marketing metrics that for various reasons we don't think are particularly useful metrics in evaluating our business. And the first investor who asked us that, we told him that. We said, no, we don't, we don't measure those metrics. They aren't helpful. And then the second investor asked us, and the third investor. And finally, we said, you know what? Regardless of whether they're useful or not, we better go down and sit down and measure these bloody things and we better give an answer and we can caveat it as much as we want about why we don't think you should rely on it, but you have to give an answer because that's what people want. And that's, a, I mean, you know, even as a, a later stage business, you still learn that lesson and it's absolutely an essential one to bear in mind. Can I just ask a question? Not that I'm after the clipper tickets. Do you think there's any value in them continuing to ask that question? In the, in the investors continuing to ask our question? Um, I don't think, given the nature of how we measure, I mean, for complex reasons about our user base, um, I think that it, it's not a particularly helpful okay. metric to look at. And, or at the very least, it's a tertiary metric sure, okay. um, that may be, may be worth looking at as part of a detailed overview. But as a primary question, it kind of misses the, the core things to look at. Um, but people want it, they want it. Okay. 
Hi, I'm Linda. Um, I actually have two questions. So the first one's to Jeff and the second one's to Dan. First one to Jeff. Um, did you start a business before Cedars or was Cedars your very first this business? Is the, this is my, I've been involved with startups as sort of a, a, a team member, but this is my first, uh, uh, first one that I ever started. Oh, wow. Yeah. Good work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Very, very look. I, no, I the only the only award I get is for being able to hit my head against a brick wall more times than anybody else, and I think that that maybe that's a worthwhile award. But it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, that's that's all we've done. <laughs> the second one is to Dan. I mean, we're a profitable uh, sort of business, um, but I mean, what we're trying to do is we're trying to to recruit. I think um, graduates. Uh, well, we want to recruit graduates because I think, you know, when I came out of university, it was a bit of a catch-22. How do you get experience when, yeah. you know, when nobody gives you a job and how can you get a job without any experience? And what we wanted to do and what we want to do is then to hire out graduates and internships and to get them, to give them the experience that they need. But it's, it's about experience and it's about being in a startup, embracing it, and, and that would that then qualify as as part of your program, would that work? Yeah, that's a perfect example. So, so one of the challenges in Digital Edge is about uh, what, what are the new ways of helping young people find employment? And that's graduates, mm. undergraduates, kids yeah. leaving school. And actually, it's a, it's a brilliant example because you started off with the business to fill a need, mm -hmm. but actually there's a huge social issue you're addressing there, which is over a million young people are unemployed. And, and graduates are coming out of university with, with, you know, without employment opportunities, yeah. so it fits perfectly. Excellent. We should Thank have a you. chat. Yes. <laughs> Do we have any more for any more? Oh, another one. And this, they just keep coming. They keep coming. I, I, I thought um, your point, Jeff, about um, the investors piece and, you know, the sort of the metric is kind of really interesting. And I do kind of want to revisit that question maybe in two, three years where you know, either you can outright say they were wrong or outright say yeah. that you were wrong. Yeah, right? no, you're absolutely right. You're, you're, you know, I, I, I could be, we could be completely wrong and that's why we were wrong. Uh, Jeff, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is what do you measure? And the second one is, is there any substantial difference between uh, the crowd as an investor and the angel as an investor and the VC as an investor? So what do we measure? I mean, our main, our, our, our main measurement is, 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 in, is, is various cuts of investment activity and money moving. And part, part of the reason that the customer acquisition cost bit is less relevant to us is that, you know, we have this massive, massive base, increasingly large base of users, of people who are on the platform doing various things, but only a very, very small sub subset of them are economically valuable to us, the people who are actually reaching into their pocket and, 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 and handing over money. And so looking too much at our user base as being a, a, a source of our value is less important. We're much more interested in who of those are investing, repeat investments, how much they're investing, and a number of other different cuts along those lines. So that's that's uh, interesting. In terms of the crowd as investor versus others, yeah, I think that I think that the crowd is often willing uh, to take bigger risks. I think because in, at individual levels, it's you know smaller sums of money. Um, it you know no matter how rich you are, writing out a check for fifty thousand pounds stings a little bit. Um, it's a lot easier to take a look at something that looks interesting and looks dynamic and say, yeah, I'll put a couple hundred pounds behind that. And I think that's good. I don't think that's, I mean, I think that's actually a great way of backing risk is because you're doing it in a small, small enough way. So I think they're more willing to take risks. I also think that um, they are more, I, I don't want to sound, sound pejorative in any way, shape or form about, about professional investors or highly active angels, but many often do think they know more than they do. Um, and, and there is a, a failure to remember at times that ultimately the un entrepreneur understands more about his or her business than any investor ever will. Um, and a good investor remembers that and recognizes that and asks questions in order to gain an understanding rather than in order to prove the entrepreneur wrong. Um, I think within the professional and active investment community that gets lost sometimes. I think the crowd, because they are fundamentally amateurs, tends to be better about thinking of them themselves as coming at this with a lay person's lens. Awesome. Um, I think we're gonna, we're gonna call it a, a, a done there. I think that was a fantastically interesting session. You join me in, uh, in welcoming both Dan and Jeff there. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks.